For centuries, their stories have held the world in their spell and conjured images that have haunted the imagination. <laughs> Let's talk about Snow White. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Ashley Griffin, a Broadway performer, writer, and theater journalist. This is my co-host Poppy. Oh, if you're new here, welcome. Don't forget to click the subscribe button for more content from your theatrical Hermione Granger. So let's get started. There's a thought experiment called the Ship of Theseus that asks whether an object which has had all of its original components replaced remains the same object. According to legend, Theseus, the mythical Greek founder of Athens, rescued the children of Athens from King Minos after killing the Minotaur. He then escaped on a ship, the Ship of Theseus, going to Delos. Every year, the Athenians commemorated this by taking the ship on a pilgrimage back to Delos. This event inspired a now famous question for ancient philosophers. After several centuries of maintenance, if each individual part of the Ship of Theseus was replaced one at a time, was it still the same ship? The same thought experiment can be used for the stories we tell. And right now, I'm specifically thinking about it in reference to Snow White. Snow White is getting a lot of flack. With Disney planning a new adaptation of yet another in their long line of, to put it mildly, leave something to be desired, live action remakes of their classic animated films, the frustration around this story has reached a peak. But the sentiment has been growing for some time, with lots of people angry with the original Disney animated film and a lot of Disney princess films, because they claim that the tales glorify a passive princess waiting around for a man to save her, not to mention celebrating, especially in the case of Snow White and Sleeping Beauty, a man non-consensually kissing a woman. So, kissy time? No, I don't even know you! In fact, these kinds of issues are what live-action remakes claim to be fixing. We have a different approach to what I'm sure a lot of people will assume is a love story just because like we cast a guy in the movie. It's, uh, it's one of those things that I think everyone's going to have their assumptions about what it's actually going to be, but uh, it's really not about the love story at all, which is really, really wonderful. And whether or not she finds love along the way is anybody's guess until 2024. Um, all of Andrew's scenes could get cut. Who knows? It's Hollywood. When really they're just making things 10 times worse. This is starting to sound nothing like Snow White. <laughs> They've just got a character named Snow White, but the story seems to be entirely different. And yet, Snow White is one of the most important stories in our collective consciousness, especially now. There have probably been more commercial adaptations of Snow White in the past 10 years, not to mention in the 20th century in general, than at any other point in history. With Snow White and the Huntsman, Mirror Mirror, and the TV show Once Upon a Time notable among them, not to mention the now infamous Britney Spears Broadway jukebox musical Once Upon a One More Time that reimagines classic Disney princesses, including Snow, getting a hold of the feminine mystique and going after the real villain of the story, Prince Charming. The show announced an early closing, ending up only running on Broadway for a short time after years of development. It's also interesting how many adaptations are musicals. Once Upon a One More Time, the canon movie tales Snow White, the upcoming Disney adaptation that expands the score of the original animated film with new material from Pasek and Paul, even the Once Upon a Time TV show got a musical episode.
I'm somewhat of an expert on this story and fairy tales in general. I even wrote a novel that is a retelling of Sleeping Beauty set in the Celtic world. It's called The Spindle. Go check it out. And an off-Broadway play called Snow that explores the power and importance of storytelling as viewed through the lens of three separate but interweaving storylines, Think the Hours or Cloud Atlas, that all center around Snow White. One, the historically accurate story of how the Grimm brothers collected the tale in the first place. The second, about a Victorian theatrical family whose lives start to mirror Snow White. And the third, about a modern-day girl living with her abusive mother. So let's sort through some things about this story and get to the bottom of what it actually is, why it's important, and what has gone wrong with it over the centuries since it was first transcribed. A lot of folks are making a lot of assumptions about the tale without remembering much about it. Yes, even the Disney version. Part 1. Snow White. A history. The Grimm Brothers. So, where did Snow White come from in the first place? The tale was first transcribed by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm in the early to mid-1800s. But the story of how and why they transcribed it, along with numerous other folk and fairy tales, is fascinating. It's actually a big reason why I got so interested in studying history. The Grimm brothers were German, but being German in the 1800s was nothing like what it would be even 50 years later. Germany wasn't even really a country. It was a collection of city-states, each with their own castle and their own king. So, yeah. Ever wondered how there are so many different kingdoms with so many different princes and princesses and stories? Yeah, that's how it was. And because Germany wasn't really unified, it made them very easy to conquer. And that's exactly what happened during the Napoleonic Wars. Basically, all you need to know is that Napoleon, the ruler of France, got on a big kick about conquering Europe. And guess where Germany is? Dead smack in the middle of all the European countries, which means you basically have to go through Germany to pretty much get anywhere else, certainly if you're going between Eastern and Western Europe. And that's exactly what happened. Napoleon went straight through Germany, conquering it as he went on his way to Prussia. Then Prussia would launch a counterattack, going straight through Germany, conquering it on the way toward France. This meant that for years, Germany was a part of France one minute and Prussia the next. And this wasn't just a technicality. Whenever they were conquered, their constitution was changed, there were sanctions put on them, and in some ways most devastating of all, their books and art were burned. This was in the days when most books, especially ancient books of great cultural worth, only existed as a single copy. So if it was destroyed, it was gone forever. The Grimm brothers were scholars. They worked for libraries and universities, and they watched the German culture be utterly destroyed. They saw their very language come under attack. German at the time was not considered a high language of import, and the Grimm brothers actually wrote the first German dictionary, the equivalent of the Merriam-Webster English Dictionary. The modern version is in fact still considered the greatest German dictionary of all time, and is the official dictionary of Germany, as a way to celebrate and preserve the German language, and elevate it. They were devastated and terrified at what would happen to the German people and their unique culture as a result of the wars, and so they decided to go around Germany and collect all the tales that were a part of their collective oral history. The stories parents had been telling their children for generations, stories adults would tell around the fire, and these weren't stories that someone just made up. They went back through oral tradition for centuries. And some were the last vestiges of the German religion before Christianity. Fairies, elves, dwarves were all worshipped once. Far from the cute Disney versions, they were mythic beings carrying great power, importance, and meaning. And they were slowly being forgotten. They collected all the stories, the first time most were ever transcribed, often finding several stories that seemed to be slightly different versions of a singular or tale. This is similar to what Joseph Campbell found in his exploration of tales around the world. There seem to be certain stories that exist in our collective unconscious, whether we have been externally exposed to the telling of such a story or not. Campbell found, for instance, that some version of a Cinderella story exists in all cultures, no matter how remote or isolated they are. How could a small village that's never had contact with the outside world possibly know a version of the story of Cinderella? That's one of the beautiful, fascinating questions about the power, nature, 
and importance of storytelling. The Grimm brothers edited the tales slightly, mainly combining stories that felt too similar to include as multiple versions, and published it. It was their way of making sure the tales of the German people would never be lost. They eventually came out with new editions, Though for these new editions, the brothers began editing the tales more and more, as there was an emphasis being placed on making them more accessible to children. Doing so was a great source of disagreement with the brothers, who wanted to both find success with the book and keep the tales in their purest form. Fairy tales were not originally for children. They were not stories invented to pass on a moral. I would like to see any story written with that sole intention actually have its desired impact. They were for everyone especially adults. Seriously, read the original Grimm's fairy tales cover to cover and you will have a very different idea of what fairy tales are. In fact, the truly earliest version of Snow White was so dark that the Grimm brothers wouldn't publish it in its original form, even in their first edition. Here's that original story. Snow White is seven years old when her father begins lusting after her. Her mother, not stepmother, her biological mother, is jealous and terrified of what will happen to her if her husband throws her over for their daughter. She sends a huntsman to kill Snow, but Snow escapes into the forest where she takes refuge with seven dwarves. The queen, again Snow White's actual mother, goes to the dwarves' cottage three times trying to kill her, the third time with a poisoned apple. There is no prince. Instead, the king, Snow White's father, finds her, wakes her up, kills his wife, and marries his daughter. In fact, some of the questions and plot hole issues people have with fairy tales come from the Grimm Brothers' editing practices. Why are all the biological mothers in fairy tales dead? They're not. In the original versions of many stories, it is the biological mothers who are doing such horrible things. But the brothers changed it to stepmothers so as not to offend the mothers who were reading these stories. There was also a lot more maternal death in the 1800s, and the fear that a stepmother would replace you and abuse your children was very real. So it was a win-win situation. Why does Snow White's father completely disappear out of the story with no explanation? Well, because they weren't going to have incest in the story although they do have versions of it in many other tales. So they replaced him with a prince and just never addressed where the father went. Side note, I love watching Snow White adaptations bend over backwards to cover this plot hole. They usually throw in some line about how the king was so distraught over Snow's disappearance that they went off to the wars and never came back. One of the other important plot points to address is that of the magical kiss which has become so controversial in recent years, but is in fact not a part of the original fairy tales. I believe the only exception is in specifically the Perot version of Sleeping Beauty. In Snow White, the prince orders his soldiers to carry Snow White, still in her glass coffin, back to his castle. On the way, they drop the coffin, jostling Snow White and dislodging the piece of poison apple in her throat. She then wakes, willingly goes with the prince, and then at their wedding, they make her stepmother dance herself to death in hot iron shoes. It is, in fact, Disney who is principally responsible for the magic kiss trope that has become so much a part of our collective understanding of the story and fairy tales in general. There are other things that are different in the original Grimm version than what we've come to think of as Snow White. Snow is seven years old in the original story, for one, and the queen tries to kill her three times, once with a bodice, once with a comb, and once with an apple. As I've mentioned, the prince doesn't kiss Snow White to wake her up, and in the end, the queen is basically murdered in retribution for her evil deeds. I do want to briefly address what happened to the Grimm brothers after collecting the stories, because it has an unusual and profound connection to more modern history. The brothers became two of the leading voices advocating for a unified Germany. After the Napoleonic Wars happened, they led a honestly not very popular charge to unify Germany. After all, what king or queen is going to voluntarily give up their power and kingdom? Take pride in their culture and language and fortify themselves against another attack. Germany did eventually unify, just in time to be totally decimated during World War I. After the war, the country was so hurt and angry over the devastation it had experienced for 
basically a hundred years that they vowed it would never happen to them again. They swung in the completely opposite direction, claimed nationalistic, yes, including racial pride with a vengeance and allowed the rise of the Nazi party, eventually leading to World War II and the Holocaust. In a deeply disturbing full circle moment, the Nazis burned un-German books in the same way German books had been burned by the French and Prussians. That nationalistic pride, created in some ways by the good intentions of the Grimm brothers, led to one of the most horrific atrocities in human history. Hitler said there were three books every German household had to have. One of them was Grimm's fairy tales. But the Grimm brothers were not pure, misused saints. There is serious anti-Semitism in the original collected fairy tales, and we're not talking subtle or subtextual. It's a complicated aspect of German history that few are aware of, but it's vital to understanding what happened in the 20th century. A potential historical basis for Snow White? There are historical incidents that some believe may have influenced the Snow White story, or even been a part of the genesis of its creation, pre-Grimm Brothers. Around 1553, the Countess Margareta von Waldeck was supposedly poisoned at a young age when her romance with Philip II of Spain proved inconvenient. Coincidentally, Margareta also had a terrible relationship with her stepmother. The town where Margareta grew up was also home to several copper mines, the workers of whom were young children whose growth was stunted due to malnutrition and poor working conditions. They were referred to as dwarves. There was also a historical event in Germany in which an old man was arrested for giving poisoned apples to children who he believed were stealing from him. And there is the story of Maria Sophia von Erthel. After the death of her mother, her father remarried a woman named Claudia Elizabeth Maria von Wenigen, who was said to dislike her stepchildren. There was even a real talking mirror in the castle an acoustical toy that could speak and is now housed in the Spessart Museum. You can go see it. Some also claim that Claudia had a mirror, likely a different one to that of the toy, that she was obsessed with. It contained mercury, which was known to drive people insane who were in too close proximity to it for an extended period of time. How the Victorian era changed fairy tales. The Victorian era dramatically changed fairy tales forever. Eventually, after the Big three, the Grimm brothers Perot and Hans Christian Andersen, all of whom were wildly popular with adults, the fairy tale craze started dwindling. Adults weren't as into them as they used to be. So what did the Victorians do with books that had fallen out of fashion, regardless of their suitability for such a purpose? They put them in the nursery for the children to have fun with. This ultimately led to a rash of republications of the fairy tales, now deliberately rewritten to deliver easy morals to children. Fairy tales weren't the only victims of changing stories to suit the fashions of the times. This was the era when King Lear was infamously performed with a new cheery ending tacked on where Cordelia and Lear live happily ever after, after all the wicked are punished. <laughs> But unlike King Lear, which after a time was restored to its original form out of protest, fairy tales often stayed as they were, with no one paying much attention to the giant game of telephone being played with them or keeping track of which stories were altered and which were in their original published form. After all, the adults were paying attention to Lear. Fairy tales were now in their blind spot. Interestingly, the latter part of the Victorian era was also, as some have put it, the era that invented childhood. Children were no longer seen as just mini adults that needed to be put to work as soon as possible. Instead, the time when a child could just be a child became revered and idolized as a period of purity and joy before the trials of adulthood took over. Part of this was in relation to the first books that were written specifically to be enjoyed by children rather than just to be moral instruction manuals. Remember when that had been the original goal of earlier Victorian fairy tale adaptations? Yeah, there was a long earlier history of books specifically being written just to deliver morals to children on a platter, and the fairy tales were just edited to follow suit. This new wave of literature for children 
and glorifying childhood largely begins with Alice in Wonderland and somewhat ends in the early 1900s with the Wizard of Oz books. Obviously, we still have children's literature, but books specifically of this time with this intention in mind. Both of these books were heavily influenced by fairy tales, but this was the first time writers were riffing on the collective understanding and knowledge of fairy tales in order to create new stories that somewhat commented on what had come before. Part two, and then came Disney. Most people today know fairy tales purely through their Disney adaptations. And because those adaptations became so popular and mass media is the way it is, we tend to view the Disney versions as the final word on what certain fairy tales are, while also viewing them through the lens of what we expect from movies today. Context has not been a part of our long-term collective understanding of these versions. Part of that is because Disney has been a leading media entity for the past hundred years. Unlike the grim books that you can still read but are clearly a specific entity of a certain time and place, Disney is constantly putting out new content and merchandise based off of their earlier projects, some of which are almost a hundred years old. So Snow White, for example, exists in the odd space of being both a specific quantifiable entity and something that is made to feel very much of our current time. A child going to Disneyland doesn't know that the Snow White ride was made decades ago. To them, everything is new. And so we have to hold space for it being both simultaneously new and old, which is a complex undertaking. But we need to understand just how revolutionary Disney was. And I'm not specifically talking about what he did with fairy tales, but rather the fact that he created animation as we know it today. Up until 1937, animation meant cartoons. Short, comic bits of moving drawings that didn't last more than a couple of minutes at the most. They were silly, comic, the equivalent of a music hall physical comedy routine. They were the furthest thing from high art you could get. One of Disney's most popular cartoon segments was called Silly Symphonies. That's exactly what they were. And then Disney did something so insane, people called it Disney's folly and declared it would ruin his company and him. He was practically laughed out of Hollywood. Walt Disney wanted to make a feature-length, single-narrative animated film. Not only that, but he didn't want this film to be just a silly comedy. He wanted it to be scary, beautiful, and moving. The idea that a cartoon could scare you or make you cry was truly inconceivable. Inconceivable! Inconceivable! And then Disney made Snow White, and it did all of those things. It scared people. <gasps> It scares us to this day. Remember the questionable comments Rachel Ziegler, the actress cast as Snow in the upcoming live action remake, made about how much Snow White scared her? I was scared of the original cartoon. I think I watched it once and then I never picked it up again. Like, I'm being so serious. I watched it once and then I went on the ride in Disney World, which was called Snow White's Scary Adventures. Doesn't sound like something a little kid would like. Was terrified of it never revisited Snow White again. That's some powerful animation, especially for a medium that had never even attempted to generate deep feelings in its audience before. People were crying at the end of it. Snow White won a freaking Academy Award for being a significant screen innovation, which has charmed millions and pioneered a great new entertainment field for the motion picture cartoon. It would be like if someone decided to make a feature-length TikTok video, and it was so incredible, it won an Oscar. And yet, we look at it and judge it as if it should have been made with the sensibilities of a 2023 audience in mind. Disney's Snow White 
is melodrama, plain and simple. And there's nothing wrong with melodrama. It's a legitimate style. And it was all the rage at the beginning of the 20th century. Melodrama doesn't automatically equate to lack of substance. Most of the first silent pictures were melodramas. Pretty much all of them. That's where we get the iconic image of a girl tied to the railroad tracks while an evil man twirls his mustache. And let's not pretend we don't still enjoy it. Riverdale. Just come to the shore and we'll figure this out together, okay? <laughs> Grey's Anatomy. Remember, you're keeping him from bleeding out. No, I am 22 years old. I should not even be in here. This is some kind of mistake. She's packing. We need to clear the room. I'm not leaving. Great, let's move. I'm not leaving her. You need to get everyone out now, Dr. Burke. She's my intern. I am responsible no, for her. No, it's got to come out. It is to come out. Every soap opera in existence. I bought all of your holdings, including this house. And there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. Damn you, Alexis. I'm gonna kill you. Don't! Don't! No! They're all our versions of melodrama. Let's look at the real heart of what this tale is. Snow White is an ingenue threatened by her villainous stepmother, and she survives because of her good, kind heart. Her innocence is abused and taken advantage of, but she still retains her kind, innocent spirit right through to the end of the story. She's a teenager who dreams that someone will love her, as most of us do at some point in our lives, especially our teenage years. It's a legitimate part of the human experience. She befriends the dwarves and takes care of them, helping them, especially Grumpy, love and protect an outsider, possibly for the first time ever. And really, the whole thing is a metaphor for death. Snow White basically dies, and she's awakened by a prince who, in the Disney version, takes her to a literal castle in the clouds, and she says goodbye to the dwarves like she's never going to see them again. It's not meant to be taken literally. No fairy tale is. And the audiences in the 1930s would have known that. It's actually a whole other discussion for another day about why audiences have stopped viewing stories as metaphor and now basically take everything as literal. It's problematic and a dangerous road. No one thinks riding a horse to a castle in the actual clouds is trying to tell us a real-life face value story. At least, I'd be a little concerned if somebody really believed that was the intention. Let's look at some things Disney did that actually addressed some challenges with the story in a positive way. He raised the age of the protagonist. Snow White is seven in the original story, actually doing quite a lot for the time to make any romance in the story much more appropriate. He only had the queen come after Snow once. In the original story, the queen disguises herself and attacks Snow first with a bodice, then a poisoned comb, then the apple. He actually did worlds of good for making Snow less stupid by only having her be tricked once. He gave the dwarves unique personalities and made them specific, active characters. He had Snow and the prince meet and fall in love, albeit in melodramatic fashion, well before the prince finds Snow in her coffin. He had the prince wake Snow with a kiss of true love. Again, a melodramatic convention understood by the audience to be a metaphor, rather than have the prince decide to carry an all-but-dead snow back to his castle so he can stare at her beauty forever and ever, and then have her wake up by accident and marry the creepy prince who just wanted to stare at her dead body. He had the queen die being brought down by her own treachery, not in a dark, revengeful setup by Snow and her prince. We need to view the Disney film in the context of what it is and what it was trying to do at the time it was made. We have a tendency to think that whatever is going on now is the pinnacle of enlightenment about how things should be, including art. We often judge art for what the standards are now, but guess what? Things we consider elevated high art in 2023 might be cringe even a decade from now. A decade from now, you might be cringing that I just used the word cringe in a sentence. And we also tend to think that some stories that were popular in their time, or have even remained popular, are because people are stupid. They were moved by that because they were stupid, but we're not. We know better. That's not true. Human beings have been equally as smart, 
and stupid as they've always been and always will be. Nothing becomes a deep, significant part of the cultural zeitgeist because a hundred years ago people were lemmings. So let's not dismiss them. Let's take the stories on their own terms. Because the way we look at a story or specific take on a story today is not necessarily the be all end all of how that story or interpretation should be looked at. And things that are tropes or stereotypes, as opposed to archetypes, we'll get to that in a minute, don't start out that way. Disney kept fairy tales alive in a moving, powerful way, but his versions are adaptations of the story. And part of the beauty of fairy tales is that they can survive and even crave numerous retellings. Disney's Snow White is one version of the story. There are a lot of great things about it, but it's not the singular pinnacle version of the tale, and it's not meant to be a literal story with the intention of serving as a guidebook to young people on how romance works in the real world. Ironically, children often seem better able to recognize and understand that than adults. We need to think imaginatively and metaphorically. Snow White reminds us that sometimes the people who are most supposed to care for and protect you are the most dangerous, but that goodness and love will always win, even when all seems lost. We learn through stories far more than we do through lessons. Regardless of your religious beliefs, I find it poignant that Jesus taught largely through parables, a kind of story. The story of the prodigal son sinks into your heart and affects you far more than someone telling you, you really ought to forgive your brother. But barking morals seems to be where storytelling is headed if we leave things in the hands of algorithms and think tanks. We are making the same mistakes as the Victorian era. Part three, the difference between stereotype and archetype. There is a big difference between stereotypes and archetypes, but unfortunately, the two words seem to have become conjoined in our collective consciousness, leading to both being condemned when they appear in storytelling. For clarity, according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, a stereotype is a standardized mental picture that is held in common by members of a group and that represents an oversimplified opinion, prejudiced attitude, or uncritical judgment. An archetype is the original pattern or model of which all things of the same type are representations or copies, a perfect example. In their pure form, Snow White, the Evil Queen, everyone in fairy tales are archetypes, but they have developed into stereotypes through misanalysis and misrepresentation in mass media. Snow White, the archetype, is a young, innocent woman who remains good, kind, brave, and innocent in the best way, and survives, remaining open to giving and receiving love despite the trauma she's experienced. Snow White the stereotype is a dumb, pretty, passive girl. We get to the stereotype through a misreading and manipulation of the archetype. We need to separate the two and be able to look at the mythic story of Snow White as separate from reinterpretations of Snow White, some of which may be looking to examine those mythic elements, and some of which throw them completely out the window. But the myth is universal, important, and resonant. We must take each interpretation as a unique entity needing its own analysis and interpretation in relation to the archetype it's drawing on. Fairy tales exist in a world of metaphor, or archetype, and as I've said, they're not meant to be taken literally. J.R.R. Tolkien has a wonderful essay called On Fairy Stories, where he talks about this and the importance of fairy tales far better than I'm going to. But part of what he talks about is that fairy stories exist in a world that, as dark as it might be, is a place where, ultimately, things are as they should be. In fairy tales, at the end of the day, internal and external beauty are one and the same. Fairy tales reflect a world with a justice that our world often lacks. When a fairy tale heroine is declared beautiful, it's not a literal commentary that the most conventionally pretty girls are princesses deserving of good fortune. It's not saying only pretty girls deserve good things happening to them. Their beauty is metaphoric for the goodness of their heart. And they remain good throughout their story despite the trauma, including physical trauma, that comes their way. One grim heroine, sister, in Little Brother, Little Sister, is literally burned alive. Another, the heroine of the juniper tree, is decapitated by her stepmother. That does not affect their beauty in the story, though certainly if one were thinking literally, 
it would. Conversely, evildoers always end up with their exteriors reflecting their interiors by the time the story is over. In Beauty and the Beast, the beast's exterior changes throughout the story to reflect the state of his heart and soul. And it is only when his heart changes that he can be not just handsome, but a literal human again. It is the state of his heart that determines his humanity. I've always found it fascinating in Snow White that the queen, whose central motivating desire throughout the story is said to be being the fairest in the land, ultimately deliberately turns herself into an ugly hag in order to kill Snow White. There is clearly something deeper going on here. If the queen's real objective was to be the most attractive, she wouldn't jeopardize her beauty for anything. There are many other ways she could try to kill her stepdaughter, but ultimately it is her hatred, not her vanity, that overwhelms her. And she is willing to jeopardize her beauty. After all, what if something went wrong with the spell and she couldn't turn back is just one possible problem in order to kill her stepdaughter. Snow White is not a story about two women competing to be prettier. Another thing I find so interesting about Snow White is that it is the only fairy tale in which being kind to an old woman doesn't result in good fortune. In any other fairy tale, again, take Beauty and the Beast as an obvious example, if there's a poor old woman and you don't treat her kindly, invite her in and accept her gift, you're in for a real tough time. <laughs> But part of the metaphorical and subversive brilliance on the part of the queen is that she's taking something that is sacrosanct in the mythic world of fairy and using it to manipulate and abuse Snow. In any other fairy tale, Snow would have helped the old woman and, in receiving the apple, gained protection or a wish. This is actually another smart tweak on Disney's part. He had the hag tell Snow that the apple was a magic wishing apple she is now deserving of because of her display of kindness something that would have been true in any other story. Here, Snow's kindness is being horrifically used against her, turning what is best about Snow into the means of her destruction. She's not just a stupid girl. The archetype is powerful and beautiful, but the stereotype has taken us down a problematic path. Part four, contemporary retellings. Snow White has been retold numerous times, with a special emphasis on the story coming in the 1980s through present day. And most of those interpretations in the 80s and 90s came from the creative spark of people who had fallen in love with the tale, often likely initially through the Disney version, and wanted to keep examining and exploring the various aspects of the story. But as we moved into the 2000s to 2020s, that spark seems to have been replaced with how can we milk this IP for all it's worth and fix any issues anyone might have with the story? The result of which is a lot of incredibly forgettable and expensive productions that cause more problems than they set out to fix and have made no actual impact on the culture at large. Let's look at some of the most significant Snow White adaptations. This is obviously far from a fully inclusive list, but these are the ones I think are of special import to examine. Hello, I'm Shelley Duvall. Welcome to Fairy Tale Theater. Fairy Tale Theater was an American award winning live action fairy tale anthology series that ran from 1982 to 1987. It was created by actress Shelley Duvall, who loved fairy tales. When I was 17, I began collecting antique illustrated volumes of the classic fairy tales. In talking about the tales with my friends and fellow actors, I found that all of them, young and old alike, were enchanted and excited about the possibility of performing the stories dramatizing the tales in the style of the old master illustrators with the video magic of modern technology and just a touch of humor. And so, with the love of fairy tales and a little help from my friends, fairy tale theater transfers these classic stories from the printed page to the television screen. Each episode would lean on inspiration from a particular famous artist from Norman Rockwell, Goldilocks, to Klimt, Rapunzel and stayed truer to the original versions of the tales. And with the exception of some added scenes for Sleeping Beauty, these adaptations are some of the most accurate to the source material ever made, though they refrain from going so dark that they become inappropriate for children. The series ultimately adapted 25 tales from well-known classics like Snow White and Cinderella to lesser-known stories like The Boy Who Left Home to Find Out About the Shivers and The Princess Who Had Never Laughed. 
One of the other things that sets this series apart was the caliber of cast and creative teams Duvall recruited. Episodes were directed by the likes of Francis Ford Coppola and Tim Burton, written by Jules Pfeiffer and Eric Idle, and the cast featured a who's who of the most famous artists of the times, from Robin Williams and Liza Minnelli to Tatum O'Neill and Christopher Reeve. Snow White starred Elizabeth McGovern as Snow, Vanessa Redgrave as the Evil Queen, and Vincent Price as the Magic Mirror. It stays very true to the original story, including the Evil Queen trying to kill Snow White three times, though it does add a brilliant ending tag with the Queen going mad when she is enchanted to never be able to see her reflection again. And you, my Queen, with a vanity unsurpassed and a soul of cruelty, shall find at last a fitting end to your lack of grace. You shall never again see your beautiful face. But, no, no, I, I have dozens of mirrors. And each and every one as you look in it shall turn to black. Vanessa Redgrave is a revelation as the queen, giving 110% and having a ball. She plays the character as someone who is utterly consumed with entitlement and vanity and is just this side of sane, slipping further and further to the other side as the story progresses. McGovern Snow is all the wonderful things we expect from the character, but she is also quirky. She makes her entrance joyfully running into her stepmother's room to show her stepmother how the court jester has taught her to juggle, only to be humiliated when the queen mocks her and throws her out. All right, come in if you must. I did not mean to disturb you, but look what the court jester taught me. What on earth are you doing? Juggling. Juggling? How horrid! How dare you! Smart, rational, and a bit of a tomboy. I don't even miss the castle anymore. It's too big and cold and lonely. Although, I did like the moat. A moat? With water? Once when I was little, I jumped in and I swam. Nobody knew, of course, or I would have been punished. McGovern manages to capture that perfect quality of a child becoming a woman and all the challenges and discomfort that brings. She is pure and good and kind, but flawed. She yearns for attention and struggles with insecurity. The most fascinating thing for me about this adaptation is the relationship between Snow and the Queen. Although it's brief, this is one of the rare adaptations. I know the pieces that I'm about to reference in this video are going to challenge this, but trust me, it's relatively rare, where we get to see a bit of the dynamic between the two before the mirror declares that Snow has usurped the Queen as the fairest of them all. And interestingly, in this version, the mirror declares, as usual, that the queen is the fairest before seeing an interaction between her and Snow, where Snow is searching for her stepmother's approval and the queen is needlessly cruel to her. The mirror deliberately changes the ranking to take the queen down a peg or two for her cruelty. It has nothing to do with looks, though that's how the queen interprets it. My queen, bad news for you, I fear. Since Snow White has come so near, I've changed my mind. I have come to find that she is by far the fairest of the fair. What? Snow White? That scrawny pest! How dare you speak to me in such a way! It's a lie! An outrageous lie! My queen, to accept the truth with the dignity and grace would be far more rewarding than forever fretting about your face. 
I adore fairy tale theater, and this may be my favorite live action adaptation of Snow White. It fascinated me as a child, and in fact, it was the dynamic between Snow and the Queen that sent me back to the original story. I found it so interesting that in the original, it clearly states that the king remarried a year after his first wife died, and it wasn't until Snow was seven that the mirror declared her the fairest. Also, let's remember that the events of the story happened when Snow was seven years old in the original. And they don't say like a massive amount of time goes by when she's at the dwarves either, necessarily. So I always wondered, what was the relationship between the two of them like during those first seven years when the queen was the only mother Snow had ever known, and the queen didn't yet have a reason to hate Snow? That was one of the things that inspired some of my choices in my play. If I had to recommend one adaptation to check out, it would be this one. It's delicious in every way. Uh, it's a sad but true fruit woman. Oh, well, perhaps you would like a grape. Or... Oh, no. <laughs> and some company. Hmm. Well, thank you very much, fruit woman. <laughs> My, what a lovely apple. Is that for no. sale? Oh, but there are nicer things than apples, Prince. Oh, sure. Don't you find me irresistible? Oh, uh, why, yes, of course. No. 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 Yes. No. Yes. Oh, I forgot. What? Oh, never mind. Canon Movie Tales is the collective name for a series of cinematic live action fairy tale musical adaptations created in the late 1980s, produced by the Canon Group. Filmed on a very low budget on location in Israel, they nevertheless feature major stars in the principal roles, including Helen Hunt and Aileen Quinn in The Frog Prince, Amy Irving in Rumpelstiltskin, Morgan Fairchild and Kenny Baker in Sleeping Beauty. Cloris Leachman in Hansel and Gretel, and the phenomenal Dame Diana Rigg as the evil queen in Snow White. This Snow White adaptation walks a fun line between historical fantasy and fairy tale camp. The performers, for the most part, are charming. Nicola Stapleton is a wonderful young Snow White, but her older Snow counterpart leaves something to be desired with her rather bland portrayal. There is a very fine line between innocent and stupid, and whereas Elizabeth McGovern and Nicola Stapleton make it clear that those are two very different things, this older Snow's portrayal is an example of precisely the reason they are too often equated. In this version, we actually get to see Snow's mother before her death, the remarriage of the king, and the growing hatred of the queen for her stepdaughter. This queen is Joan Collins-esque, a kind of real housewife of the enchanted kingdom who is completely self-obsessed. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of us all? Her vanity would be comical if it weren't Dame Diana in the role. One thing this version does beautifully is how it deals with the passage of time. The queen sends her huntsman to kill Snow while Snow is still a young child. This is basically a 9 to 12 year old who is about to be murdered in the woods, with the huntsman clearly disturbed by his mission. She runs into the forest and finds the dwarves' cottage not too long after and settles in with her new friends. The fact that she wants to and is even able to help care for them not only speaks to her kindness, but to her humility. This is a princess who is not only happy to, but actually knows how to cook and keep house, which is quite the marvel considering the environment she came from and grew up in. They actually turn this into an interesting character detail. As time passes, Snow has to learn to sew, routinely letting out and adding hems and cuffs to her one and only dress so that she can keep fitting into it as she grows up. Years go by where the queen believes Snow is dead. In the interim, Snow grows into a young woman who is painfully fully aware that sooner or later she will have to leave the dwarves she loves so much and make her way in the world. If nothing else, she is becoming too tall to fit inside the house. This passage of time also helps us by that Snow is no longer constantly on the alert for danger from her stepmother. It's been somewhere between five to ten years that she's not heard hide nor hair from her, though this becomes negated by the fact that this version sticks to the original tale in regards to the queen trying to kill Snow three times, seemingly in 
very rapid succession. After the second time, the dwarves say, You mustn't let anyone in. And a slightly vacant-eyed Snow, who looks like she was given her script pages 30 seconds before the director yelled action, which considering the filming conditions, she might have been, responds, But she looked nothing like the queen. It was a disguise. But she looked nothing like the last time. It becomes a little bit like, I mean, really, Snow? Just lock the door. The songs in this version are uneven, to say the least, exacerbated by the wildly divergent singing abilities among the cast, the case with most of the canon movie tale adaptations, though it is a joy to hear Aileen Quinn sing in The Frog Prince. The charming Hoppin' on My Daddy's Knee bedtime song for Young Snow and the King. Do you think that we could dance? Yes, I think that there's a chance. Take my hand and hop, hop, hop with me. Enough! Snow White is past your bedtime. Your Majesty, we don't want to be late for the ball. I shall be in my room. Good night, Snow White. The lovely story advancing every day, sung by older Snow and the Dwarves, which serves to cover the large jump in time. But till the day I just don't fit, beds will be made and lamps will be lit. I'll bend my knees and then my head won't hit as I keep growing bit by bit. Every day when work is through and our little house comes into view, there's something special that we like to do. We holler, hey Snow White, she answers. Yes, that's right. We holler, what's to eat, she answers. Like those feet. Oh, every day there's work to do. Looking for gold and cooking a stew. We sure been busy, but we're still not through. We gotta dig down deep. I've gotta sweep, sweep, sweep. We gotta move this dirt. I've gotta help my skirt. We gotta dig, dig, dig. I'm getting big, big, bigger. Hey! are contrasted with the average and lacklusterly performed opening song, Let It Snow, and the both eminently watchable and utterly cringe, More Beautiful Than Me, as the Queen's big solo. Watchable for the wonderful Dame Diana, cringe for the truly awful lyrics. So you think that she's more beautiful than me? We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. It's impossible that she could ever be as lovely as me. For years I have always been the fairest. That's why the king has picked me for his queen. Who would have thought that she would be a beauty? Who would have foreseen? It turns me green. How can this possibly be? That it's she, that it's not me. For one, there's the way I do my hair, and the way I do my makeup with such care. With the gowns I pick, and my fur so thick, is this a trick? And it must be noted, this adaptation features an extended sequence involving Yellowface. The queen switches up her disguise each time she tries to kill Snow. Smart. But for some reason, on her second visit to the cottage, the queen, with no explanation, decides to disguise herself as an Asian peddler woman in basically full geisha makeup with a bad Chinese accent. This is aggravated by the fact that the first disguise donned by the queen is clearly meant to be a version of a, to be blunt, stereotype of what has been referred to as a gypsy woman. Just why these decisions were made, I have no idea, but they are there. Rig at least tries to ground the choices as much as is humanly possible, but still there's no excuse or justification for them. Snow White, A Tale of Terror was a 1997 horror adaptation of Snow White. It leans heavily into the, well, grim elements of the original tale, and until it completely and utterly jumps the shark about two-thirds of the way in, is kind of brilliant. This is Snow White as a horror movie. If you're going to play cat and mouse, just remember, I'm the cat.
led by Monica Kina as Lily, Snow White, and Sigourney Weaver giving a masterclass of a performance as Lady Claudia, the Queen. Note how they used the historical name of the real-life German woman with that talking mirror. Yeah, the film did its homework. Until it didn't. Set squarely in historical Europe, the exact time is never specified, but this is not a magical kingdom far away. The story announces its intentions early, opening with Lord Frederick and his first wife traveling home by carriage when they are accosted by wolves. In the chaos, his wife goes into labor, and at her urging, Frederick reluctantly performs a cesarean section to save their unborn daughter. Years later, Frederick remarries a noblewoman named Lady Claudia. Claudia is, in fact, an incredibly kind stepmother who does her best to care for and bond with young Lily, but Lily is resentful toward her new stepmother and, let's be honest, is a bit of a brat to her for years. We learn that Claudia's mother was a practitioner of witchcraft and has given Claudia a mirror that seems to be, well pretty shady and potentially evil. When Lily is a teenager, Claudia becomes pregnant. At a ball to celebrate the impending birth, Lily deliberately dresses exactly like her dead mother, accentuating her inherent resemblance, causing her father to, well, start having some incestuous inclinations toward his daughter. Claudia is humiliated and becomes so distressed that she ends up giving birth to a stillborn son, rendering Claudia unable to have any more children. Utterly devastated, she is soon corrupted by the power of the mirror and swears revenge on Lily. Claudia tries to have Lily killed, but Lily flees into the forest, taking refuge with seven ruffians who, initially, do not have kind intentions toward her. The threat of sexual assault is very present. Suffice it to say that this is where things go off the rails with Claudia doing some pretty heinous things and hatching a plot to use a twisted magical ritual to raise her stillborn son from the dead. There is no prince, the stand-in becomes a puppet and sexual plaything for Claudia, and he is disposed of in the final act. The true story equivalent is one of the ruffians who Lily falls for and who wakes her not with a kiss, but with violent shaking to remove the piece of apple from her throat after he realizes she's still alive. The one bright spot in the second half of the film is the apple scene, which is brilliantly done and involves an actual extended conversation between Lily and a disguised Claudia. It even includes a truly horrifying monologue that Claudia delivers to Lily's rigor mortis body while looking her dead in her still very open eyes and join in the fact that you can see and you can hear. But from inside the tomb of your mind, no breath will escape your lips, no tears your eyes, to the world you are dead. And soon, even your precious father will forget you are ever alive. But you, my dear, you will have all eternity to remember. The end turns into something of a traditional horror film finale with an awakened Lily heading back to the castle to kill Claudia. This is an adaptation that has a very clear reason for being. To explore the truly dark elements of this fairy tale, and by proxy, all fairy tales, we tend to forget how horrifying the stories really are. But things like incest, murder, and feeding children to their parents, all of which happen to greater or lesser degrees in this film, are found in just about every grim story. Neil Gaiman has said, fairy tales are more than true, not because they tell us that dragons exist, but because they tell us that dragons can be beaten. And this film gets to the heart of just how real and terrifying those dragons can be. Believing that a man will save you, is as far from the message of these stories as you can get. And this film is a great reminder of the aspects of the story we tend to not remember or think about. Sigourney Weaver said in an interview about the film, Well, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to play um, the stepmother in Snow White is that these stories, like Snow White, the husband, the father of the girl, always married this dreadful woman who was cruel to the child. And I remember just thinking, I don't understand why the father is always so stupid that he marries these not just unpleasant women, but they're killers. Um, so when Snow White, the, the, you know, the feature came along, 
Um, what I what I thought I could do with it is present a, a woman who married someone with the best intentions to be a good mother, to take the place of the dead mother, who truly loved her husband. And I think in our story, um, Snow White rejects the stepmother again and again and again. The father doesn't really take sides. And when she can't have her own children, the aging thing, all of this starts to come into play. But it was, it was very interesting to go into one of these fairy tales and, and sort of test its truth. It, it was interesting to me to go in and see how this actually could have happened. That's how you explore a fairy tale in a realistic setting, by starting with the archetype and working your way outwards, not by trying to put band-aids on a stereotype. In the early 2000s, though I believe he started on the book earlier, Gregory Maguire, of Wicked fame, wrote a novel adaptation of Snow White set in the rural Italy of the early 16th century and featuring the historical Borgia family who were known for poisoning their enemies. The book walks a fine line between historical and supernatural, leaving it up to the reader how much of the magic is in the characters' heads, though ultimately coming down on the side of magic. There's a wonderful scene when Bianca, the Snow White character, finally finds refuge in a cave in the forest after running for days. Utterly exhausted and starving, she begins to pass out, noting that there are seven large stones in the cave, and just as she loses consciousness, sees them turn into dwarves. It is also highly implied that mercury poisoning from Lucretia, the queen's mirror, is largely responsible for much of the tragedy of the story. Notice how the 80s and 90s had some really good adaptations? Certainly cool and interesting. This was part of the 80s fantasy boom where they didn't shy away from the darkness of fantasy tales. Artax's death, anyone? Artax! Bueller? Adaptation choices were made for artistic reasons, but in the 2000s, Snow White adaptations started to take a nosedive. Snow White, the fairest of them all. This 2001 film starred Kristen Kruick as Snow and a wonderful Miranda Richardson as the evil queen, Elspeth. This was a pretty forgettable and epically padded out Snow White that attempted to give some backstory to the king and evil queen. Some of the choices are intriguing. Elspeth is an ugly ogress, sister to a magical being that must grant a wish to the king, who at this point is a poor single father named John. As part of that wish, he needs to give John a kingdom and by proxy, a queen. To please his sister, the magical being uses Elspeth for this task and transforms her into a beautiful woman. Maintaining her beauty and the power it gives her is a large motivation behind her machinations against Snow White. Some choices are less so, including the dwarves backstory involving being trapped as garden gnomes in the queen's garden. There is an interesting interpretation of the apple scene in which Elspeth, trying to seduce Snow White into eating the fruit, doesn't transform into an old crone, but rather into Snow's long-deceased mother, adding several layers of creepiness. Taste it, beautiful girl. And you'll never be tired or hungry again. Never. I promise. Sometimes I get so tired. And sometimes you feel so alone. Yes. How did you know? I understand you. I care about you. You won't be alone anymore. My darling, just take a Bye. Sydney White was a 2007 film starring Amanda Bynes as a modern day snow facing off against the mean queen bee of a sorority, jealous of Sydney's meteoric rise on the school's hottest list. And after making friends with the seven dorks, gets a malware poisoned Apple computer that almost ruins her chances to be class president. Yeah, I don't really know what to say about this one other than it was yet Another attempt at the popular teen comedy formula of updating a classic story and putting it in a modern setting. But unlike Clueless and 10 Things I Hate About You, this one just fell flat. Finds his 2006 film, She's the Man, an update of Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, while far from a masterpiece and not without its problems, was a more successful and purposeful adaptation of a classic work. Mirror, Mirror. Another forgettable and far from successful adaptation that aimed for comedy and some kind of 
girl power reimagining and came up severely short on all fronts was 2012's Mirror Mirror, no relation to the Maguire novel, starring Lily Collins as Snow and Julia Roberts as the Queen. The take here is supposed to be that this story is being told from the Queen, Clementiana's point of view, which is then negated in the final narration, which confirms that this was Snow's story all along. What a twist! <laughs> In this version, the queen tries to enchant and marry the prince herself, and Snow must break into the palace and rescue him. There's a subplot involving the heavy taxation of the commoners, the dwarves training Snow in combat, and there is no apple consumed. Side note, I do find it hilarious that in this film, Sean Bean once again plays a ruler who tragically dies too early in the story. That's some career consistency. Directly competing with Mirror Mirror, 2012 also gave us Snow White and the Huntsman, which set out to make a warrior girl power Snow White. And here we start in earnest down the female empowerment adaptation trail. But there's been a long history of mistaking female empowerment with traditional symbols of masculinity. Putting a weapon in someone's hand, anyone's hand, does not automatically make them empowered. Colin Stokes gave a wonderful TED Talk called How Movies Teach Manhood. In it, he says, You know, my favorite part of being a dad is the movies I get to watch. When my daughter was four, we got to watch The Wizard of Oz together. Totally dominated her imagination for months. Her favorite character was Glinda. You know, you watch a movie enough times, and you start to realize how unusual it is. There's very little violence in The Wizard of Oz. The uh, monkeys are rather aggressive, as are the apple trees. But um, I think if The Wizard of Oz were made today, the wizard would say, Dorothy, you are the savior of Oz that the prophecy foretold. Use your magic slippers to defeat the computer-generated armies of the Wicked Witch. Side note, this is basically exactly what happened in Oz the Great and Powerful, but it was a male chosen one, the future wizard, having to save the female-centered Oz. Stokes goes on. Um, that's not how it happens. How does Dorothy win her movie? By making friends with everybody and being a leader. Like, that's kind of the world I'd rather raise my kids in. Oz, right? And not the world of dudes fighting which is where we kind of have to be. Why is there so much force, capital F force, in the movies we have for our kids and so little Yellow Brick Road? I think we have got to show our sons and model for them how a real man is someone who trusts his sisters and respects them and wants to be on their team and stands up against the real bad guys who are the men who want to abuse the women. Seek out the heroines who show real courage, who bring people together, and to nudge our sons to identify with those heroines and to say, I want to be on their team. When I asked my daughter who her favorite character was in Star Wars, you know what she said? Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan Kenobi and Glinda. Now, what do these two have in common? I think these people are experts. I think these are the two people in the movie who know more than anybody else, and they love sharing their knowledge with other people to help them reach their potential. Now, they're leaders. And I would add, they are empowered. Traditional masculine force does not a leader make. Snow White is actually a great example of that. Snow is kind, empathetic, brave. She brings people together and forms community. But apparently, the way to make any woman empowered is for the men around her to chivalrously let her use their sword. And that's the trend that started taking over fairy tales, Snow White included, in the 2010s. Let's look at the actual plot of Snow White and the Huntsman. A king battles an invading army of glass soldiers. He finds a prisoner among them, a beautiful woman named Ravenna. He's so enchanted with her beauty, he marries her. Ravenna becomes queen and stepmother to the king's young daughter, Snow White. Ravenna is in fact a powerful sorceress who sucks the life force out of beautiful young women to maintain her power. She murders the king and takes over his kingdom, locking Snow in a tower for years. Ravenna learns that Snow is actually the chosen one, the only person who can defeat her. Snow escapes and flees into the dark forest. 
the queen hires Eric, the huntsman, to capture Snow in exchange for bringing back his dead wife. But when Eric discovers that Ravenna can't, in fact, raise the dead, he teams up with Snow. Along their journey, they meet a group of dwarves who tell Snow she is the chosen one, and a tribe of women who have deliberately disfigured their faces so that they are not desirable to Ravenna. Eventually, Snow eats a poisoned apple given to her by Ravenna, disguised as Snow's childhood friend. Eric, who, let's remember, is significantly older and a widower, kisses this teenage girl after telling her dead body that she reminds him of his dead wife, and she revives, going on to rally an army against Ravenna. Snow stabs Ravenna, killing her, and becoming queen. Now, if you remove the apple and the name Snow White, is there anything about that story that would lead you to believe it was connected with the fairy tale in any way? Snow White and the Huntsman suffers from what I call Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland syndrome in that it actually wants to be a unique fantasy story, but it shoehorns in lip service to a well-known property, knowing that having Snow White or Alice in Wonderland in the title will sell more tickets than new fantasy venture. There's a problem with most female empowerment chosen one narratives in that they actually take agency away from the very character they claim to be empowering. In Snow White and the Huntsman, Snow escapes from her tower when she's forced to, she's been up there for years and basically done nothing, and then just follows a prophecy to a prearranged conclusion. There is nothing that makes this Snow admirable. She's just decent at following a plot. Plus, their attempt at fixing the issue with a stranger kissing Snow and breaking the curse actually created a scene that is 10 times worse than any objection folks may have with the original. In a very literal and non-metaphoric setting, an adult man stands over the dead body of the teenage girl he's attracted to. Then, after saying how much she reminds him of his wife, he kisses her. And the single tear running down Snow's cheek while he does it is meant to imply that, even unconscious, she's totally into it. Or conscious but immobile. We never know. Either way, totally into it. The whole thing goes from creepy to what the hell when you remember that while this alleged girl power movie was in theaters, the only thing people could talk about was how Kristen Stewart, the practically still a teenager star of Snow White and the Huntsman, was a slut who slept with her director almost 20 years her senior. People were so disgusted at Stewart, who, let's be clear, was barely an adult who had received advances from a much older man in a serious position of power over her, that she was fired from the Snow White sequel. The sequel to Snow White and the Huntsman literally doesn't have Snow White in it because Kristen Stewart was a tramp who ruined her poor director's life. Something's gone really wrong. Once Upon a Time, the TV show, not the statement at the beginning of fairy tales. Once Upon a Time was a TV show produced by ABC, an affiliate of Disney, that ran from 2011 to 2018. The show was unofficially inspired by the graphic novel comic book series Fable, which followed fairy tale characters forced to live in the real world. Once Upon a Time featured pretty much every fairy tale character in every book, and many characters such as Frankenstein, that can't be characterized as fairy or even folktale characters at all, but centered on Snow White. The series opens with the prince waking Snow up from her enchanted sleep, them getting married and about to step into their happily ever after. But just as it looks like their story is at an end, the evil queen breaks in and promises to destroy your happiness if it is the last thing I do. And she does just that, banishing all the fairy tale characters to a place with no happy endings, in a similar turn to Disney's Enchanted, and all the fairy tale characters find themselves in the real world town of Storybrooke, Maine, with no memory or knowledge of who they are or where they came from. The evil queen, Regina, is the all powerful mayor of the town. Do you like a glass of the best apple cider you ever tasted? Snow is now Mary Margaret Blanchard a shy, anxious elementary school teacher, and her prince is a John Doe in a coma in the hospital. In Storybrooke, all the characters' strengths 
have become their weaknesses. Mary Margaret is insecure, timid, and self-depreciating with none of Snow White's courage or fortitude. But pretty soon, an outsider, Emma Swan, comes to town. It turns out that Emma is the savior who can break the curse, but she is a real person who doesn't believe fairy tales are in any way true. She becomes the town's sheriff, and as she goes about righting the social wrongs she sees around her, slowly certain characters' memories start to return, and it seems there may be a path back to the fairy tale world. All the while, Emma must learn the lessons at the heart of the darkest fairy tales and take charge of her own life and traumatic past as she sets the town to rights. Personally, the first season of Once Upon a Time, barring a few episodes, is one of my favorite seasons of television of all time. It strikes a brilliant balance between honoring the stories we know and love and addressing how those stories can have weight and importance in the gray, real world in which we live. The creators also made the fantastic choice to have characters' stories interweave and affect each other, taking more than a page out of the wonderful musical Into the Woods. Rumpelstiltskin, played by the genius Robert Carlyle, as an almost comedia figure. I can ease your mind, but it's going to cost you something in return. <laughs> Turns out to have been Cinderella's fairy godmother, with not entirely altruistic intentions. Trust me, all magic comes with a price. As well as the beast to Emily de Raven's bell. Several of the best episodes of the series were penned by Jane Espenson of Buffy fame, and the series is at its best when putting the human condition at the center of a magical framework. But after season one, the show jumped the shark. Aided by the fact that in later seasons, the show was forced to go to a fewer episode with a giant mid-season break model and shoehorn in as many Disney characters as possible. The show quickly went from a high-concept exploration of identity, myth, and the power of stories to a villain-of-the-month, serial-esque soap opera. They also robbed themselves of seasons' worth of fantastic storytelling opportunities by, spoiler alert, ending season one with every character getting their memories back and the curse being lifted. The show quickly became a how-do-we-fight-the-new-monster-and-get-home saga of monotonous repetition, and pretty soon we didn't even care if the characters ever went back to the fairy tale world or not because, again, spoiler alert, they go back again and again and again. Oh, and fairy tales weren't just loosely connected anymore. By the time the show went off the air, the literal family tree of how characters were connected was more convoluted and incestuous than the most shocking of soap operas. But when the show went right, it found a remarkable balance, with the character of Snow White especially, between being the character we know and love and also a complex modern-day woman. Yes, this Snow wielded a sword on occasion, but it was her kindness, eternal hope, courage, and self-sacrifice that made her a leader worthy of that moniker, not her battle skills. Though, I can't really speak to that in later seasons. In the early seasons, the show fleshed out Snow and the Queen's backstories in a way that brought these archetypal characters into a complex, specific world. The specificity of these characters, and the art with which they were played, made these fairy tale characters real people in a way few adaptations have successfully achieved. And they undid all that great work starting in season two. Films with a Snow White influence. Now, there are lots of works of art that aren't direct Snow White adaptations, but the thread of that story runs through them, whether intentionally or not. Joseph Campbell talked about universal stories, and indeed, every story ever told can be traced back to one or more of the Ur stories in our collective consciousness, or unconscious. Take any story. You can find a myth, fairy tale, etc., that it mirrors, because the heart of all stories are mythic, and there are only so many myths, or, or stories. I think a beautiful example of this is the 2013 film Gimme Shelter. Based on a true story, important when you think about the true connection and applicability fairy tales and myths have in our real lives, Gimme Shelter follows Apple, Vanessa Hudgens, a teenage girl who has been in and out of foster care for years as her mother is an abusive drug addict who only wants Apple for the welfare money she provides. Mommy loves you. Show me back! 
Finding herself pregnant, Apple runs away in search of her absent father, who she discovers is now a wealthy Wall Street broker with a family. He offers to take her in, then rescinds when he discovers she wants to keep her baby. When a pimp forces her into his car, Apple grabs the wheel in an attempt to escape and ends up crashing the car. She wakes up in a hospital where she connects with a priest who offers her a place in a home for pregnant teenage girls run by a formerly homeless woman. You're suffering. Where was God when I was suffering all these years? You think you know me? You don't know anything! 20 years ago, I opened my home as a shelter. Hey, everybody, this is Apple. But Apple's mother finds her there and violently tries to force her to leave. Your mother will not give her consent for you to be here. She will never let me go. No, no. Apple bonds with the other girls at the shelter, gives birth to her baby, and begins to reconcile with her father. She ultimately decides to stay at the shelter, feeling like she finally has a home. It's crazy. You can go and live with strangers and feel like a family. After all, at the end of the day, what is Snow White, if not the story of a homeless teenager trying to escape her abusive mother? Part five. So what does this all mean? Now, at the beginning of this video, I referenced the ship of Theseus problem, but that was a bit of a misnomer. It's an interesting thought experiment when looking at adaptations invested in examining a well-known story and how much of a root thread is needed to keep it connected to the source material. But it becomes a different matter when a reinterpretation isn't really interested in examining the story, but rather in using the trappings of it for branding. Then it becomes less a valid intellectual exercise and more like, well, a scam. Less analyzing an ancient ship that has had each of its pieces carefully remade according to guides and necessity, and more like walking up to a harbor and seeing a sleek modern super yacht with Theseus written on the side. What do you mean this isn't the ship of Theseus? It's a ship and it says Theseus, so it's the ship of Theseus. Give me your money and you can ride on it. And then you go on board and there's nothing of note and nothing historic, and you're mad that you threw away your money, and then the guy who sold you the ticket goes back to his think tank where they decide the real problem was that they didn't make it a seaplane instead of a super yacht. That's kind of exactly what Disney has been doing with its live action remakes, and it seems their upcoming Snow White stands to be the worst of the lot. It's like they wrote a generic female power fantasy story and then slapped on the iconic dress and the name Snow White and got mad when you questioned if it was the real thing. It's like we're the vapid damsel in distress who can't stop eating poison apples from the same strange woman wandering in the woods who we keep wanting to believe is going to be good and honest this time, and then we just keep thinking, the rats foiled again! And people criticize Snow for being stupid. Here are some of the things they've allegedly done with Disney's Snow White live action remake. This is based on test screenings and maybe, please, changed before the official release. The poisoned apple doesn't make Snow appear dead. Instead, it makes her no longer care about being a leader. From the opening shot, Snow is principally focused on being a warrior and doing battle training. She is apparently a warrior prodigy able to take down her teacher after just beginning lessons. The evil queen and her huntsman banished the seven magical creatures, no longer the seven dwarves, to beyond the forest because they were too powerful. There's no prince. In the opening sequence, Snow sings to the moon about wanting power to be a leader and hating romance. <laughs> Can we take a minute for the fact that wanting power is what the queen wants? And it's Snow in contrast to her and valuing kindness first that makes her the heroine? It sounds like they're taking the worst things from previous adaptations and putting them all in one movie. Snow White and fairy tales in general are important, but not as superficial cash grabs, but rather as a means to explore the human condition and how to move through our lives. Fairy tales are a bit of a Rorschach test, and we can always find new and surprising things in them, often just what we need at that moment in our lives. But in the past 20 years, mass media has simply been creating superficial, made-by-committee generic fantasy stories with a well-known and loved title, like Snow White, slapped on for brand recognition. If that is the primary, if not only, way the next generation learns these stories, that brand will lose 
any value because no one will have any reason to think that these stories are important or anything more than superficial. And the irony is that the more relevant these committees claim they're making the story, the less relevant they become. No one wants to be preached at that we should just be girl bosses and pick up a sword and that will solve all our problems. If you want to make a story about how women shouldn't rely on romance to solve their problems, great. Tell a story about that. But it has nothing to do with Snow White, and it never has. Likewise, Snow White is not about how you should rely on romance to solve your problems, but I don't think that's a message anyone's hankering to focus an adaptation on. If you want to tell a story about how women can be leaders and warriors, awesome. But again, that's not what Snow White is about. And on and on. Trying to shoehorn those ideas or morals onto a story you think you know and take umbrage with is no different than the Victorians slapping their own morals on well-known and loved tales. King Lear with a happy ending is many things, but it's not King Lear. Snow White, remade by focus group committee and trying to put a generic girl power spin on the story, is not Snow White. And the more you try to disguise some artificial story as a meaningful, well-loved, and widely recognized entity, the more you are going to dilute and render mute that original entity in the collective consciousness. Disney was once a revolutionary studio creating classic works that have long been meaningful in the cultural zeitgeist. Now they are a production company that eats and regurgitates its young. Eventually, Disney is going to have nothing original left. When we don't get new stories or intelligent, purposeful retellings of existing stories, what will we be left with? In 20 years, will we be on Disney's fifth Snow White live action remake? Snow White and the seven AI who deserve human rights and shouldn't be treated as property? Snow White and the rise of sixth wave feminism? Generic winter princess and the reason real stepmothers aren't abusive according to statistics? We need to go back to the heart of our stories and view them with a discerning eye. And we need to stop supporting and making projects that are doing way more harm than good in a plethora of ways. What stories are meaningful to you? How have they had an effect on your life? I bet not a single one of you thought of the live action Lion King remake when you thought about those questions. I'd like to see a story that moves me, affects me, makes me think. I'm not interested in having focus group BS shoved down my throat at the movies, on TV, or on Broadway. What about you? The end.